We dressed up for you, Mr. Thanks, I, I tried to catch up with my speech. Yeah, I mean, I was already mentioning that economy, I don't doubt that's a topic for equalities. I mean, look at these people. I mean, <laughs> I mean, tell us, Christian, how many economists really live in eco villages anyway? <sighs> Very difficult introductory question. Mm, let's say if you refer to university professors that juggle with mathematical models and try to translate social interactions into financial equations, mm, probably none. But if you refer to the original term oikonomia, uh, possibly all eco-villages, because the original term oikonomia means management of the household and it includes activities in the kitchen, in the garden, in a workshop, raising children. And if a university professor never cooks and never works in the earth and not participates in care economy and does not manage a household, well, the original term economia does not even apply for him, although he might be a Nobel laureate. Exactly. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, what, what is an economist? When did this all begin? Was there, what's this all going from? Maybe we don't know exactly, but there is one strong reference to ancient uh, Greece, and we know Aristotle, and he wrote a book on oikonomia and defined for the first time precisely what he understood by it. Before Aristotle, there was Xenophon, and he coined the term oikonomikos, and this was the male white um, household boss who dominated women and slaves, you know. And there was before Xenophon uh, Foucludes from Millet, and he termed, he coined the term oikonomos, even 100 years before, that was 2,500 years ago. And the first mentioning of that term meant housewife. So the first economist was literally a housewife. And I think economic science today should honor it, should remind, of us, remind us of it, and should include this fact into their theory and models. And talking about Aristotle, because I'm very much fond of Aristotle, besides being patriarchal and slavery, <laughs> But uh, his thinking is uh, lucid and his legacy is um, groundbreaking because he already defined oikonomia as uh, activities where the overarching goal is the common good, the well-being of the household members, whereas money and capital and material goods were just means. And he said, if this relationship of ends and means flips around, we pervert the oikonomia into its opposite, into chrematistike. And chrematistike, today we don't have this term any longer, but we use the term capitalism. And Aristotle said that capitalism is the opposite of oikonomia, because in capital, capitalism is first about money, capital, and material goods. And he says that's anti-natural, that's a perversion of the natural order of things. Hey, I think, isn't this the moment? That's the moment. Is yeah. this where he got the hands? Yeah, I think so. He's doing something funny. Yes, I, I, I used it with two microphones. That's a little bit more difficult. I hope so. So, this is famous DK. And I have to be a bit cautious with the mics. And this would be an oikonomia. Both work, as you can see. But not for everybody, not all the time. And yes. Um, and embodiment for me means that I always check if I can feel what I say and sometimes act it out with my body. And another message of this inversion of the order of things is an invitation to change perspective. Because changing perspective sometimes is scary, or most of the times it's scary, but also quite insightful. And as a dancer, I know that going backwards and downwards <laughs> is one of the most scariest movements for a human body. And still, it can lead you into deep joy. 
So I would ask my fellow contemporary dancer Alkis from the world that reconnects movement to demonstrate this scary exercise. Thanks, Alkis. One way to go backwards and downwards is this one. Oh no, it's fun, it's great, it's fantastic. And I even can go further and not lose my mic. New insight. <laughs> and there's another exercise. We go back to back. And uh, once again, uh, we dare into the new. Like Vivian is always inviting us. To, the strong side of the fear coin is going into a new situation. And an even newer situation, I'm still fine. I'm still fine. I'm still fine. Oh, now it's getting really scary. But with Alexis, wow, with Alexis, Wow! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. And all this care is turned into joy. And here's the last one. I know. Feel free to give Alexis his experience. Al Alkis, I'm sorry, his experience. I'm ready. Oh. Again, backwards and downwards. And he's not dying. <laughs> he's flying. I got you down. And he will survive. <laughs> Thank you so much. <sighs> My brother in dance. <laughs> I got to know you yesterday. <laughs> so thank you very much. Never too late to meet Alkis, but it was this just like <laughs> something very Joyful, playful, but does it have to do anything with economy? Yeah, I mean, this is all very nice, but come on, Christian. Aren't you just set up the whole economics as well? Uh, me? Uh, catches me by surprise. Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> if I had studied economics, the probability would be significantly higher. <laughs> but um, homo economicus is a very recent phenomenon. It only appeared and was first mentioned in the 20th century. So more than 2,000 years later than the beginning of economics. Imagine that. 2,500 years ago, economia, homo economicus, only 100 years ago. And what it stands for all depends on time and culture. And what we teach and learn in economics textbooks. But. Are you, are we all super rational, target oriented, competitive, materialistic, insatiable utility maximizers? <laughs> to me, that sounds rather like a psychopath than a gentle and interesting fellow citizen. <laughs> it's a cruel mutilation of our species. If we reduce ourselves to the famous I think, therefore I am, René Descartes. And nowadays economists sometimes even sharpen it to I calculate, therefore I am. <laughs> but humans are by far more complex and holistic and as a consequence humane. For instance, I feel, therefore I am. I be. be, therefore I am. I listen to my intuitions, therefore I am. I dance, of course, therefore I am as well. I love, therefore I am. I maintain relationships, therefore I am. I'm connected to nature, therefore I am. And I'm part of the universe, and therefore, we are.
We are all that, and therefore, we are. Thank you, Marginale. You really pointed out beautifully my point, which is that only if economic science is based upon this complete and holistic fundament, it can turn into sound and sustainable science. Yeah, well, this sounds like you have an idea. I mean, it, it all sounds very beautiful, and you were sort of criticizing the state of the art in terms of economics, but do you think he has an idea? Why didn't you tell us about your vision for the economy of the Congo? Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure <laughs> to do this now. <laughs> And I will start with the last reflection on Homo economicus. Um, do you think that if humans really turned into super rational, target oriented, competitive, materialistic, uh, insatiable utility maximizers, that they could become happy? It's, it's a rhetorical question, but, <laughs> but it's serious. It's serious. And to evoke collective wisdom, I would like to ask you what makes you happy. And in a simple exercise, which is, I invite you to close your eyes for a short minute and remember the happiest moment of your life. One situation, one experience, one image. Then we send the answers to the departments of economics of our universities. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that, it is unavoidable. <laughs> so, I now invite you to share with one word the situation, the memory, the experience you just, uh, that just popped up in your mind. Just speak it out loudly, please. Dance, connection to nature, birth, beauty, collectivity, collectivity, <laughs> presence, well, what? Music. Dance. Ecstasy. Dancing, ecstasy. <laughs> Singing. Singing, of course. Community. Community. Relationships. Relationships. Swimming. Swimming. In a swimming pool? In money. <laughs> In money, yeah. That's, you got the first prize. In economics, yes. <laughs> no. The jokes always have to be added to that serious exercise. And my experience of the last, let's say, 15 years is that all the answers can be ascribed to four levels of relationships. Relationship to myself, to oneself. Relationship like um, presence or beauty. I related that to that. Relationship to other human beings, like birth. Birth is the m most frequently named memory, both by women and men, by the way. Relationships, love, community and connectivity. Third, um, connection to nature. If I'm allowed, I put the swimming into that. <laughs> and connection to the greater whole. I heard that too. And presence could also be union with the greater whole. And never, ever, never, ever, money or cars or jets or yates or swimming pools are mentioned. And that's quite insightful. And I think it's an interesting result for economists. And from here, we come to the question what the economy is ultimately about. Is the economy ultimately about happiness? We already heard about the economics of happiness. Vivian Dittmer mentioned Helena Norberg-Horch 
And the, you might have heard about the well-being economy approach, and there is the gross national happiness even in the state of Bhutan, and there is broad prosperity in the Netherlands, and there is buen vivir in the Anden countries. Um, but what does science say, by the way? What, according to economic science, is actually the economy all about? Efficient management of scarce resources. What? Efficient management of scarce resources. Efficient management of scarce resources. What? Efficient management. Efficient management of scarce resources? Is that a science? It's not efficient at all. Well, maybe in the kitchen or on a limited planet, depending on what type of resources we talk about. But maybe let this uh, put aside and allow me to offer you an alternative definition and mission of the economy made by the movement of the economy for the common good. We understand by economy the collective, the collective effort to satisfy human basic needs of living and future generations within the planetary boundaries and aligned with democratic values such as dignity, solidarity, justice, sustainability and democracy. In short, the common good. That's just an offer and we could build on that and we could build a science on that, a new science of economics on that. And this definition applies no matter if economic activities unfold on markets, through public services, in commons, in households, or in eco-villages. Everything counts. Everything that contributes to happiness in this meaning of satisfied basic human needs under all these conditions contributes to economic success in the new meaning. I'm asked to repeat the definition, so I very slowly. Uh, we understand by economy a collective effort, all these activities this set that satisfy basic human needs of living and future generations within the ecological boundaries of the planet and aligned with fundamental democratic, I would even say constitutional values such as human dignity, solidarity, social justice, ecological sustainability and democracy in the meaning of transparency and participation and co-determination. Well, now comes a tricky question. The tricky question is, um, this is a nice definition, but in the end we need a broader agreement and for a broader agreement in our worldview as democracy is one of our fundamental values we propose a broader participation to compose the common good product. Because as important as a sound definition of what the economy is, is a metric, a measurement, a dashboard, where we want to head for with our regional countries' economy, local economy, and most importantly, by what to replace GDP, the gross, nation, the gross national product, the gross domestic product, which is a mere aggregation of financial transaction and does not tell us anything reliable on our happiness or on unsatisfied basic needs. That's why we propose the common good product. And we would only like to include in the common good product what most matters in our lives, what most matters in your lives. And I ask you again, if you could co-create and co-determine what are the most relevant ingredients and components of the best life imaginable, your individual life and the collective life of all. Which components and ingredients would you like to include in the common good product? Water, Water. Water. Well, flourishing relationships, love, nature. peace, Soil. nature, Mutual help, so for soil, 
diversity, yes. clean air, arts, arts. I thank you, thank you for all your contributions and proposals. And what we are heading for is to organize this process in every community, in every region, in every city, and ultimately in every country. And out of the many proposals, what will be the result is a set of, let's say, 10 or 12 or maybe 20 sub-goals, which in their totality compose the common good. And the average result in any country in the world where I have asked the citizens so far is the combination of health and happiness and flourishing relationships and social cohesion and just distribution and political participation and fundamental uh, rights and stable ecosystems and peace. Maybe these, maybe some others, but if this set of goals, you can imagine a colorful dashboard replaces GDP, all economic activities, no matter if business, trade or finance, are measured against their, these goals, against their contribution is measured against these goals. And only if they contribute to these goals, <laughs> they are kind of legitimate economic activities in the future. I make it concrete, um, maybe still make it more concrete. Um, we, we now heard the, the goals, no? and the goals are not measurable. I cannot measure health. To measure health, I need an indicator. And an indicator is measurable. And one possible, it's just an example, one possible indicator is life expectancy. And the higher the life expectancy, the healthier the people, the average life expectancy, the healthier the people in these countries. This indicator has now replaced by a new indicator because science is progressing and the new indicator is healthy years of life. Healthy years of life. So now we have a better indicator. And with this I want to illustrate that the goals are defined by the citizens and the people, but maybe the indicators how we measure the achievement and the progress of uh, the goals, these could be made with the help of science as well. Then we would have a bottom-up and top-down marriage of the wisdom of the sovereign citizen and the wisdom of science. And um, yes, and then we would still have a number because you can count every indicator and every sub-goal. But my bet is, I'm all, also always realistic, my bet is that we will only achieve to replace the gross domestic product as the main indicator of economic success. That we can only replace this successfully if we put on its place a measurable alternative. Not in monetary terms, very importantly, but just in points, just in common good, in qualitative, in ethical common good points. Uh, that's why I now explained it a little bit deeper. And once we have made this exercise, once there is a new dashboard with all your most important uh, sub-goals of highest possible life quality, we can derive this instrument directly to the business level. Which means that we ask all companies, no matter if it's a cooperative, an association, a limited company, or any other organization, a university for instance, we ask all these organizations, what's your contribution to these 20 sub-goals? And we measure it. And this is what we call a common good balance sheet. And it exists, because this is the first concrete and practical creation of our movement. We have managed to bring this into the world, and it has been applied by more than 1,000 organizations in more than 20 countries so far, in three continents. That's not all over the world but it's in a growing number of countries. And most importantly, it has not only been applied by companies, and I make a short pause here because I love the etymology of the word company. Does anyone know what company means? Breaking bread together. You know it already. Cum pane, eating or breaking bread together. That's the original meaning of a company. Yes. So, we are not applying this with companies, but also with universities, schools, and even cities. Some cities have already made this common good balance sheet. And now, very important, the common good balance sheet has a score. <coughs> and the higher the score in points, again in points, 
the more humane the working conditions are, the fairer the, the tax contribution, uh, the stronger the ecological standards, and so on and so forth. And the, the lower the degree of inequality, for instance, and the more equal the involvement of all disadvantaged. Just some examples. The higher its core, and less you. Today, the, the more a company engages, the higher its costs, and the less a company engages, the lower its costs and the lower its market prices. And the higher the market prices, if it engages more in this. And this is a system error. The more a company engages for our holiest values, the, the, the bigger its competitive disadvantage on the markets. And it should be the other way around. Another inversion of things is needed. And we propose to provide these sustainable and responsible companies a whole series of advantages and vice versa disadvantage to those who do not care for anyone, for the planet, for the society, for humans. How? Well, in public procurement, we give priority to those companies who do best in ethical terms. In economic promotion, the same. These pay lower taxes, these pay higher taxes, these get cheaper finance, these don't get finance at all. <laughs> because the banks for the common good say, well, uh, we don't see any reason to give you a loan because this is not a true economic activity according to the new definition. And in the best case, you get a loan at the rate of 10% to 20. And then you're less competitive than the most sustainable company in town that gets a loan at a zero interest rate or even at, at a negative interest rate. And at the end of the day, the companies that do best will be able to offer their products and services at cheaper prices to the audience than those companies that are damaging the common good in any way. And this will still be a market economy. And some will think internally, is Christian talking about markets now? And am I sure if I want to have markets at all in the future? Then my answer is yes. Now I'm talking about markets, but I have already mentioned and even emphasized that the economy for the common good considers the economy as a combination of markets and public services and commons and households and communities. And all stages have the same value and all contributions count into the common good product equally. But probably where reform is most needed, because they are so dominant today, is markets. And we want to change markets from capitalistic markets, where it's all about profit maximizing and counterpetition, actually, to ethical markets, where there is no capitalism in any longer, because companies are striving for the common good and trying to cooperate with one another. That's the proposal and the idea. And and other initiatives are focusing on commons, and other initiatives are focusing on improving public services, and other initiatives are focusing on the care economy. Just one sentence on the care economy. Our proposal, after having heard the most diverse proposals, is that probably as the next step, the best uh, reform is to consider care work as a public service and acknowledge it accordingly and pay it accordingly. Thanks. I, I know that not everybody uh, agrees, but uh, let's keep discussing which is the best way to come to make the next step. And maybe then the visionary ultimate uh, 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 state of being is different. But let's discuss which is the possible next step. And uh, the economy for the common good is a very uh, comprehensive and holistic model. I do not dive into all elements now. I just have touched a few of them. It includes ethical world trade as an alternative to free trade and protectionism. It includes the reduction of hours worked on markets to, let's say, 20, because we need more hours for commons and for communities and for democratic participation and for care work, just for instance. And it includes, this is quite recent, 
limited individual ecological consumption budgets. Should I repeat that? Limited individual ecological consumption budget. Imaginal, could you <laughs> perform that? <laughs> Yo. Well, what do I mean? I'm talking about the ecological cake. Um, economists love to talk about the cake and take it as a metaphor. And usually when economists talk about the cake, they talk about the growing cake. And then usually the narrative is if the cake grows, everybody can have a bigger piece of the pie. That's the traditional economist's narrative. Um, but if we it, if it talk about the ecological cake, <laughs> well, maybe let's one last reference to the usual cake. Uh, this may be the case in, in a just distribution, but what if the cake grows and someone gets a much bigger piece and many others get a smaller piece, even if the cake grows? So we, we should question this metaphor. Please don't use this metaphor. I'm just referring to what is currently told in economic education in order to challenge it, in order to not accept it uncritically, in order to create our own meta metaphors like the donut. I think the donut is the better metaphor than the cake. Uh, but it's <laughs> the donut, I have to explain the donut. The, what if the cake is not growing? Or what if it's shrinking? Uh, the ecological cake, let's say it's, it's a planet with stable ecosystems. Have we, do we have ever stabler ecosystems currently or do we have, have ever instabler ecosystems? So I would say the ecological cake is shrinking. And what, what does now efficient management of scarce resources mean? If the cake is shrinking. Um, I think it's getting more understandable and we should use our own terms and metaphors that humankind as a whole is now using 1.75 planets according to the concept of the ecological footprint. So Mother Earth is offering us an ecological gift, bioresources or biocapacity, which we are not using, but you're using almost a double. And that's why the famous World Overshoot Day is moving backwards every year, not forward in the, in the year, but backwards. It was at the end of December in the 1970s. In the 1970s, mankind as a whole was still at the sustainability threshold. In the 1980s, it moved backwards to November, in the 1990s to October, uh, in the early new century uh, to September. And this year, most of, or some of you will know, we are on August 2nd. On August 2nd, mankind as a whole has consumed all the resources, all the renewable resources that the planet offers to us, mankind. Country-wise, uh, there are some countries that do not have at all an Earth Overshoot Day because the average citizen of that country, most countries of Africa, for instance, are not using what, uh, what they could use in a both just and sustainable global distribution. Other countries like Germany had their country overshoot day on May 4th. May 4th. Not everybody in Germany is overconsuming. In uh, The average citizen of Germany is overconsuming four to five times. But at Sieben Linden, for instance, <laughs> they're only using a, qu a quarter of that budget. So Sieben Linden is almost touching their sustainability threshold. And it's a proof that it's, it's possible in a different way. Um, yes, applause to Sieben Linden and all other eco villages and sustainable communities that try to bring their ecological footprint to an average of 1.6 global hectares. The current CEO of the global footprint is a global hectare and that global hectare produces and absorbs everything we need and we emit. That's in, in a nutshell. And currently uh, the planet offers us 1.6 <coughs> hectares. And I don't know the ecological footprint of Jeff Bezos. But I do know, we do know, the ecological footprint only of the yacht of Taylor Swift in seven months. So probably her overall footprint is higher, but the first seven months of her private jet is 4,000 times the sustainable level. So 4,000 times the 1.6 hectares. 
And now what's the consequence? The consequence could be um, we are all equal, humans are equal. We have equal rights to water, clean air, and a healthy planet. And as a consequence, every human being is allowed to get her or his 1.6 hectares in an ecological currencies. And every time you buy in markets a car or a yacht or a jet or a, a holiday travel or you fill your swimming pool or your tank, you have to pay an ecological currency. But ecological currency is limited to 1.6 global hectares. So you only can buy for what you have ecological purchase power. And why does this occur to us, and it's not only me, because there are so many instruments and measures of environmental policy and sustainability strategy, and none of them really works. The planet is deteriorating on an accelerated pace, at an accelerated pace. And that's why this thought to limit everybody's Taylor Swift's as well as Jeff Bezos, as well as the inhabitants of Siebenlinden or any average, other average citizen of Germany or Ghana, they get the same amount. Well, it's just an idea. We can think about it and we can keep discussing it. And maybe a last, a very last proposal of the economy for the common good is uh, another topic of inequality. This is Eco this has been ecological inequality, and I was trying to talk about ecological justice. Yeah, let me give, let me give me a last thought on that. Um, reminder, I'm over time going over time now. This, I'm talking about justice, but others will immediately say this is jealousy. And uh, do you know the difference between jealousy and justice? Here's an offer. Jealousy is if you disagree that someone enjoys something that she or he has deserved. That's jealousy. And justice is that we disagree that someone enjoys something that she or he has not deserved. It's a double negation, so let's put it positively. Justice for me is that everybody has the same opportunity to enjoy her or his part of the ecological cake. If one consumes 4,000 parts of the cake, there is no cake for many others. And last year, there's a lucky, there's a lucky, this is now a lucky moment. Last year, there was declared a new human right, a first ecological human right. Did you know that the General Assembly of the United Nations declared the human right of access to a healthy, clean, and sustainable environment? This is now as human. We, we, we cannot um, request it uh, before a court. No? It's just a declaration. It's not a binding rule. You cannot put a lawsuit, but we, you, we will be able to put a lawsuit. In order to avoid many lawsuits, the idea is to, to declare on the back side of the same coin, the front side is the human right to a clean environment. And on the back side, we could limit every human's possibility to overconsume in ecological terms. That's ecological justice. And now comes my last proposal on social justice. And the last proposal on social justice connects to the dissatisfaction of people virtually all in the world with the current state of inequality. But let me check that back with you. Is anyone here on the ground who thinks that the current level of inequality globally or in your country is justified and fair? I don't see any arm raised, and how can that be? My answer is, it's due to democracy, due to a lack and the, the, the flawedness and the weakness of democracy. And that's why I would like to invite 10 or 12 of you to come up on stage and play with me a better democracy, a stronger, a more participatory, a direct democracy. I call it sovereign democracy. I don't have the time to explain it today, but I, we do have the time to play the game. So please, 12 um, humans of all genders and sexes come out to me on stage and play with me that game. It's a three minutes game and it will not be painful to you and you will not be ashamed by anyone. 
the media are not here anyway, so maybe five more. If you are 12 or 15, that's fine. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes, all, all that are now uh, coming to stage, please come to stage. Yes, we can make a, a half circle. I make the, the notes here. So maybe you make a half circle that everybody can see you. This is a, let's say this is a citizen assembly. And the citizen assembly um, has the mandate of the parliament or of the constitution already. It was, it was initiated by the citizens because in the future constitution it will say if 1%, 3% or 5% of the citizens in the country ask for a citizen's assembly on a specific topic, it will be established. And the proposals of that citizen assemblies will be voted upon by the whole citizenry, by all people living in this country. This is the future of democracy. And we have now two steps. The first step is I ask you um, where you would limit inequality in income if you could do so. And my question is very simple. My question is, let's guess there is already a minimum income in a country which is sufficient to cover your basic needs. Minimum income covers your basic needs. No human can earn less than the minimum income. We decided this last year in 2048 or something. And now uh, we can <laughs> take the second decision if we want to decide a maximum income. And the maximum income is a multiple of the minimum income, a maximum multiple in the meaning no human being can earn less than this or more than that in this country. There can still remain inequality, but only between the minimum and the maximum. And now you are asked to make proposals where you, if you ask yourself, your heart, your inner wisdom, where would you limit the maximum income in relation to the minimum income? as a maximum multiple, and I take note. Three times. Three times? Two times. Okay. Yes. So we need to know the minimum. Okay. No, the, the, the minimum is cover, all basic needs covered. All basic needs covered. You will get, the, those who cannot see this flip chart, you will get the result um, with the minutes of the meeting, so I already have one proposal which is three times. Are there more proposals? Two times. Yeah, now starts a long and broad discussion. And <laughs> <laughs> thanks for that, but we don't have the time to discuss now. Uh, we only have the time that I show you a method of decision making which is different from the method that the parliament decides and that the parliament decides on one proposal and everybody has to vote against or in favor. This is a different method of decision making. First, um, it's a compl complementary to the parliament because if the parliament doesn't touch the question of inequality, the citizens could take initiative. And the citizens can make several proposals because maybe there is not a single best solution so we already have two proposals. One proposal is to limit maximum income with twice the minimum. A second proposal is to limit maximum income with three times the minimum. Are there further proposals? Because we will vote on all proposals. That's my promise. 200 times. 200. 200 is the third. And six is the fourth. Seven times. Seven times. 25. 25. OK. Shall we let it there? The same. Okay, that's one. Okay, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven proposals, and we will vote on all of them. But not voting and showing our hooray and our <laughs> uh, affirmation, because then the loudest, the most powerful, or the most resourceful of you might make a campaign, and her or his proposal might win. We do it differently. One second. We show our resistance, or you show your resistance, against all seven proposals, how, how much you dislike it, how much it hurts you if it became a rule. And the winner is that proposal that generates and provokes the least resistance, that causes the least pain in all of you, not one of you, but all of you. 
because that might be the wisest, the most empathetic, or that proposal that approaches best to the common good. Is there a question for the procedure? I yeah. have a procedural question, yes. yes. Uh, everyone, all the companions here indicated a number. I would like that, that each of us who propose a number just supplies the choice so that we, we could all be sure that this is not just a random number that came to my head, but that it has a qualitative foundation, but that yes. it's based on an actual assessment. And, yes, you know, and yes. Day. There's a need to, to further and deeper discuss the proposals and the premises and the framing. Uh, the ordinary process takes at least a full year because we wanted to take it. <laughs> and this is just picking out, uh, selecting one short, more actually the final moment of voting. I'm just picking out the final moment of this year-long process with deliberative democracy, with listening to all proposers, with listening to all stakeholders, with after having heard experts of all walks of life and disciplines. So after extremely thorough and deliberative democratic process in the very end, and uh, uh, very much informed, the citizens vote. And this is the moment. Sorry for, for not explaining everything in short and scarce time, but thanks for, um, for putting that in. So I hope you feel now ready to vote. <laughs> and I ask you to show seven times your resistance. And there are three ways to show how to show your resistance. And I'm the, why I'm doing it with only you um, 15 or something, because I cannot count all the arms of all of you. That's the only reason. But you can count with me if I count correctly, so it can be my, my watch, my, my democracy watch. Um, but I am better than any machine in Florida, just for instance. <laughs> no, just, uh, that's proof, that's scientifically proven. Okay. Um, so the first way to show your assistance is to listen to the proposal. Uh, if it's adopted, it will end up in the constitution of your country. And then feel the pain. With that, with that result. And if you don't feel pain, you just do nothing. You have no energy uh, for assistance, and you just raise no arm. The second option is that um, you listen to the proposal, and you imagine that, and then woo, there is some hmm, sticky, itchy, scratchy, and there is some resistance. You have major questions, and you raise one arm, one arm of resistance. And the third option is you listen to the proposal, uh, proposal and you listen to the pain, and woo, it's so painful that you have a lot of energy to resist against and raise two arms. Got it? Yeah. yeah, no resistance, little resistance, strong resistance. Right. We. Hmm? You cut it again? Sorry, I was thinking of resistance. Strong resistance. Mm -hmm. And some resistance. No resistance, some resistance full resistance against. So we go from the lowest to the highest. We go from two to three to six to seven. We go from one, thank you, to two to three to six to seven to 25 and to 200. We always need co-creation and collective wisdom. Otherwise, the machines run away from us. OK, so the first proposal is one means there is no inequality. Highest and lowest incomes are identical in the same working time. Every human being earns the same, equal income for all. Please show your pain with and resistance against this first proposal. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-two, twenty-four, twenty-five. I counted. Second proposal, the highest income may be up to the double of the minimum income. Please show your pain with and resistance against a maximum income inequality of two times the minimum. I start counting here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Third proposal, highest income can be up to three times the minimum wage. Please, your pain with and resistance against maximum factor of inequality of three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 
Next proposal, it can be up to six times. This is the highest possible inequality. Please your pain with and resistance against factor six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and twelve, fourteen, fifteen. Factor seven, please show your resistance against factor seven as the highest possible income related to the minimum. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, sharp. Second last, twenty-five times is the maximum. Please show your pain width and resistance. Two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, one, two, three, four, five, six, twenty-six, more or less. And the last proposal is um, maximum only two hundred times, no more. Please show your pain with <laughs> some <laughs> resistance. Okay, two, four, six, eight. It's almost unlimited. I can't count it. And now, if ever a proposal of the economy for the common good enters a textbooks of economics, I would like that this chart enters. This chart is resistance, no resistance, or yeah, I can churn it a little bit, no resistance, mid medium resistance, high resistance, and inequality. No inequality, medium inequality, high inequality. So what is the result of this voting? The result, the winner is the one that provoked the least resistance, 25, 19, 30, oh, it's factor three. So in this case, in this community, factor three will become the law. And in this country, in the country of global connected eco-villages, no person could earn more than three times the minimum income in this country. So the lowest resistance is inequality here, three. We started with one and we ended with 200. This was the last proposal. And now comes um, resistance. Resistance was um, at 25 with against factor one, and it was at unlimited with uh, factor 200. And the, the, the curve we have is this. It's, an, it's a U. It's, a, it's not theory U, it's a U. Um, and the U has a bottom, which is the lowest resistance, which is the best possible solution, which is the most uh, close to the common good proposal, which is three times. And we have strong and high resistance in, in comparison against extremely low inequality, which I call socialism. So high resistance against socialism. And we have even higher resistance against capitalism, against an extreme arena but unlimited inequality. And this is insightful. People resist both socialism and capitalism. And what they use to vote for is, you know it? Common sense. <laughs> the, the economy of the common sense, exactly. The economy of the common good or common sense. Slash. Great, yes. Um, well, that, that's how democracy would work in an economy for the common good. Thank you very much for playing with me. You can go back to your seats. It was extremely insightful. Thank you. To be continued. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christian. Thank you so much. And we will have just a few. We will hear just a few more moments from Christian in a few minutes.